Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome to Shelf Stories, the channel that tells tales from games, books, and life. I am your host, Jason. Thank you so, so much for stopping by for this latest episode of Good Trouble, where I engage in conversations around the board gaming community that might be a little bit difficult, but I try to do so in a spirit of education and compassion. So today's episode, it is the fourth of five videos that I have prepared for Black History Month, race relations, cultural relations, conversations that are very difficult to have. Um, I'm hoping to add a little bit uh, so that we can improve the level of our conversations. This episode, episode in particular, uh, I feel like uh, I'm going to address a particular aspect of online conversation that just goes wrong, I think. Almost all the time that I that I uh, engage with it, so I want to try to bring in a piece uh, from my background as a psychotherapist and also a student of psychology. So this episode is going to lean much more into my psychological background, talk about implicit bias and how it might be playing out in the gaming space and in our online conversations. Before I do that, though, please. Um, Go ahead and subscribe to my channel, Shelf Stories. Uh, like this video, spread the word. Thank you so much to everybody who has subscribed. Lots and lots of new subscribers, people who have engaged, people who are on Twitter and Facebook and different places, uh, spreading the word about what we're trying to do here. What I'm trying to do here, let's not use the royal we, it's just me over here. <laughs> uh, I am trying to have better conversations, more compassionate conversations, because as I said in the last video, I think that the board gaming space is worth it. There's no explicit language in this episode, but there are some tough themes, might make a couple folks uncomfortable, so um, please just keep an eye out for that. So I'm just going to jump right in. There is a term that gets used in online conversations that as soon as it appears, doesn't matter who, which side is using it, I can already tell that the conversation is going to go turn way left, more heat than light will be generated, and arguments and butthurt feelings and all sorts of stuff will happen as soon as it appears. I've been talking about racism in these last few videos, but the particular term I'm, gonna, I'm talking about now is racist. That label of that, in terms of being applied to a person, is one of the worst things that can possibly happen, uh, you know, especially among my white friends. That's the worst thing. It's the thing they don't want to, they don't want more than anything else. Uh, they talk about white fragility. It's like, well, that kind of triggers white fragility more than anything is thinking that you, that someone is being, someone is accusing you of racism. It just goes left. I really feel that, and I'm going to make this one of the theses of my video here, that it's... It's become problematic. It's an overused term. It's not serving its intended purpose of just, you know, clarifying a position or anything. I think it's just become so fraught with baggage. And I want to try to really walk back everybody's usage. And everybody's thinking about this term and replace with something else. Get to that in a second. Um, on the left, and I make no bones about my, my empathies, my position. I'm a progressive person. Uh, I do have to acknowledge that that term gets thrown around a little bit too freely, a little bit too often, um, especially when applied to a person. So I want to be very careful because, you know, I don't want to say this about anybody, particular person. Uh, people need to kind of search their social medias, their interactions and see for themselves whether that's actually what is happening on their personal end. But I think just as a general judgment, um, I think that we may be a little bit too trigger happy by saying, okay, that person says something problematic. They must be a racist or some kind of permutation of that. I like to help my side of things become a little bit more reflective about whether that's useful or not. And also on the right. So my you know, people that I argue with, uh, discuss, chat with and everything. I think that what happens is that, uh, some people are too quick to assume it's being used. So then something will happen, and I've seen this happen frequently, where, you know, someone will say something problematic or whatever, and then someone from my side will say, okay, that's why, you know, that that was not great, and, you know, kind of giving a well-reasoned discourse, and the person uh, who said the thing will respond with, well, I'm not a racist. Don't accuse me of that. And then, well, I didn't accuse you of racism. <laughs> and it becomes a whole thing. And it wasn't even a cure. It was just kind of a, 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 a red light that occurred. It's like, well, I'm not a racist. It becomes this immediate defensive wall. Right. 
And if you're laughing at that, it's like, what is that? What does that really happen? Well, look at how people responded to the Black Lives Matter movement last year when there were a lot of calls on publishers and, you know, event organizers and people in the industry with power to make statements and, you know, kind of make declarations, you know, you're for the Black Lives Matter, or, you know, are you for justice, all that kind of thing. Someone would make a statement, it'll be kind of weak sauce or kind of miss the mark and would say, you know, like, we just gotta, this isn't good enough or whatever, whatever. And then the person would come back and say, well, well, leave, give me a break. I'm not, I'm not a racist over here. I'm not part of the problem. And it's like, <sighs> not what we said. <laughs> so why is it so problematic? Because we're social animals. And the board gaming community, like as much as we might say we're a family, like we're not, we're a voluntary community that is trying to get along as a family. But at the end of the day, this is a, this is a, um, there's consensus that has to get built. And when someone gets that label or if that label gets stuck to them, now it's almost like you've painted them with a scarlet letter. You've, you've put the big old target in their back. You're saying, well, that's a racist. They are open to harassment and exclusion and blocking and exile it's like it's a it's a step process right so like before we can really lay in on a person we have to give them a label first and when that person what you know whether whoever it is when that per that label gets affixed i think we all know that we all know what's coming after that so that's why we get so defensive when we either are actually called a racist or when we think we're being called a racist, even if maybe we're not. So it's a label of exclusion. It is not a label of description. We need to be very, very careful, I think, when using that, especially when it comes to talking about a person. I said in the last video that, you know, I, I looked at a statement and I said the statement was racist and I was careful to distinguish that from the person. I would like to encourage every single one of us to be as reflective as I try to be when it comes to that red hot radioactive label of racist. All right, so that was my little PSA uh, <laughs> when it comes to uh, the what the video is all about. Uh, if that's you know what you're here for, I know how long people watch these videos, uh, maybe a little bit long, uh, but if you want to get the main message, there you go. Just be more careful, more reflective about that word, whether you're on the left or the right. I'm trying to talk to as many people within this big board giving tent as humanly possible, whether I agree or disagree with you. Um, so just think twice, three times, four times, five times, as many times as you, as you need to before using that t phrase when it comes to a person. But if, if that phrase being used, trying to call something out, and we need another tool to understand some pretty bad stuff that is happening and things that are kind of stopping us from progressing and being that truly multicultural space. So what I would like to do with the rest of this video, and like I said in the intro, I'm gonna really get into some research and it's gonna feel a little bit like a class. So I hopefully uh, impose upon your patience a little bit. Thank you very much for coming along for the ride. I wanna talk about bias. Bias is different than racism. Racism is an intentional act. Racism is a, a willful thing, whether it's a willful um, insult or injury to somebody or a willful ignorance about the practices that you're doing. Bias is neurological, psychological. We are all biased. It is a feature, not a bug. Uh, we are not robots. We are organisms. And it is something that I think it would benefit us to learn to embrace and work with. Um, so folks like my metaphors, <laughs> uh, I feel like a good metaphor is that imagine bias as a tree. And I'm going to describe three branches of those trees, uh, which can combine to produce the fruit of racism and things that we don't want, whether explicitly or implicitly without us knowing. It doesn't have to, though. If we're aware of our biases and if we're aware of what's going on, I think that we can become better humans and also learn to be better to one another.
right, so the first aspect of psychological bias we're going to talk about is in the way that we see. So we have a bias towards familiarity. You know, we are, we don't just look at the entire world and see like a bunch of same stuff. We react strong, more strongly and we affiliate more strongly with things that are familiar to us. Seems really obvious, right? But I really want to hammer this home because I think a lot hinges on this core concept, right? So you can see this neurologically. We're talking put people in a scanner and MRI machine and read what's going on, read what's going on neurologically, read what's going on in terms of circulation and blood flow. When we show things, especially faces, faces um, respond or uh, awaken multiple aspects of uh, the occipital temporal region. So the aspect that I want to focus the most on is called the fusiform face area. That is way down in our brains. And general, you know, the deeper down in our brains, the more we are going to respond. And the fusiform face area is in charge of distinguishing friend from stranger, familiar and unfamiliar. So not surprisingly, when we show faces that are familiar to us, whether it's family relation or they look like us, they share quality with us, increased blood flow, increased whole neural activity. And what does that result in? It results in more re total recognition, more ability to read the face, more ability to interpret with the, the subtle signs of the face, uh, more engagement with the face, and maybe even on some levels, more of an instinct towards empathy. So it's not just faces and people, right? It's anything. Uh, so, you know, I have a whole wall full of games over here. My wife comes down here. She's not a gamer. She sees a bunch of boxes <laughs> with some colors. And I could tell you chapter and verse about all the games that I got on my shelf. Uh, anything, right? I mean, sneakers, birds. I, the birds is not my thing. When I play a uh, copy of Wingspan down to play, it is 200 varieties of pigeon. Uh, as a New Yorker, that's all I know. So if I don't have the familiarity. I bet there are some people out there that can tell you chapter and verse, Oceana, the whole thing. The one that blew me away personally when I read about it was maternity nurses, a really experienced one, uh, has that familiarity, has that exposure to babies. And they can go into a, a maternity ward with the room with all the cubicles or little the things full of babies, and they can pick apart every single one. And me, I have, I have two of them. You'd hand me the baby. I'll go, oh, I, I, I'll take your word for it. That one's mine. <laughs> to me, that's kind of a superpower, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> pretty jealous here. The reason I bring it up here is that it maps onto race as well. We are biased towards more familiarity, more of an inclination to have affiliation, all those other good things with someone of our race. We can really see that in an effect the psychologists call the other race effect. And so this is a really difficult one to talk about because it sounds racist, but... It's this part of it, it's science. We have a hard time distinguishing faces of the other race. When I was growing up and I first went to a pretty smart school and I was exposed to uh, more Asian kids, I couldn't tell Chinese, Japanese, Taiwanese, Korean. They'd say it and like, <laughs> you know, and I'd, I was like, who is in your class? My, you know, my, my friends would ask me and I'd say, you know, you, you would imagine the stuff that would come out of my mouth. But it, it's, and you know, so I don't want to share it here because it, it's there's some parts that kind of lead toward racism, but just neurologically, it can tell apart. You know, I mean, that's that's a lot of jokes among, you know, in groups of like, I can't tell the difference between this person and that person. You know, white people look the same to black people. White, black people look the same to white people. It is a universal reality and it does present a stumbling block if we don't know how to talk about it correctly. So why is it important? Because one thing that happens fairly often in online discourse, you hear the phrase, I don't see race. As a person who is aware of the psychology, I my alarm bells go off when I hear that. Because from a neurological perspective, 99.9% .9 of the time, that person is, it's not true. They see race. 
and maybe they're doing something else. You know, I understand that the theory behind us, like, okay, why are we talking about race so much? Race is so divisive. Let's just not see race. Let's just, you know, you know we're all people, right? Problem is not how our brain works. We see race, whether we like it or not. And it comes out in other areas. And so I'd rather just, you know, be in the space of seeing race. And then from there, we can go on. I'll kind of go on for a second. But I just wanted to adjust that one specifically because you hear it over and over again. And maybe you are a person that has, you know, we have neuroplasticity in our brains. We can change this stuff. Maybe you have trained yourself to truly not see race and judge people by the content of their character, all that good stuff. If that's true, which I suspect, but if that's true, that'll never scale. It'll never be a universal rule. We see race. We're biased towards it. The answer is not going to be to go against our bias. The answer is going to try to be to lean into what our brains are doing and do it differently. But we don't see race. Going to have to put a big asterisk on that one. So a second aspect of psychological bias that I want to talk about is the way that we judge the things we see. So we have a bias towards categorization. We have a bias towards making these little judgments and attributions that make things easier to process. We are surrounded by stimuli. We have a great, huge, big, buzzing world full of stuff. And we have to, you know, we need a tool in order to be able to just function. Right. Uh, I like the way that a journalist put it. His name is Walter Lippmann. He says there is an economy to categorization for the attempt to see all things freshly and in detail is exhausting. We have to reconstruct the world in our minds more simply just so we can manage. So I can I know that people are kind of know where I'm going in terms of the way we judge and how that plays into culture and all the stuff we're talking about. But I really want to spend just a minute drilling down that this is just natural. It's just part of the way we think. And so I want to talk about kind of snap judgments and learning what we learn just apart from all the culture stuff. So here's an example. Uh, so let me show you a little brief clip uh, called the tablecloth trick. We've all seen that before, right? Common magic trick. Got a little tablecloth. Whoop. Uh, just rip it off the table and nothing <laughs> nothing moves. So they've run this experiment a number of times. But what they'll do is they'll, they'll show um, uh, the different subjects, right? Uh, that video a, a certain number of times. And, you know, it'll be 1, 5, 10, 20, whatever it is. And they'll kind of evaluate people's ability to think they can recreate the trick. So they'll ask them, it's like, okay, do you think, you know, that you can re re recreate the trick? So um, people will kind of like give their answers. And, but for the most part, people like, once they hit a certain number of times viewed, they think like, all right, got it. So they'll just make that quick attribution, you know, quick categorization. And in this case, categorization is, got it. You know, I can do it. Then they take them to the table. They try to reproduce it. It's a disaster. <laughs> they can't. No one could ever do it just off a couple of videos. Um, speaking of that, though, the reason I bring this up, because it's very relevant to board gamers. Uh, so, you know, I have a bunch of uh, games over here. We're always learning rules, right? We're always reading books. We're always watching videos like my friend Rodney Smith over here. Hey, Rodney. I know that you uh, tune into some of my videos. Thank you very much for that. Um, but we have people that are watching half a Rodney video, and they think, I got it. They, they make that quick judgment, right? They make the quick attribution based on what they're seeing, and then they, you know, kind of carry that forward from there. It doesn't go well a lot of time, does it? You get it to the table, and it's like, uh, didn't, don't know this as well as I thought, huh? Anyone who's been to a con, anyone who's been to a lot of different tables, they go to different, <laughs> you, you, you engage in different games, and sometimes the teacher knows it, but sometimes, ugh doesn't go well even though they've been shown the game even though they've you know i had to prep it before uh you know they opened the booths didn't know it as well as you thought did you it's natural it is natural it is natural it is natural it is part of our brain functioning we can't function without judgments that's not the problem 
the problem, as I'll get into a little bit, is when the judgments come a little bit too quickly and where the judgments come from. But I really want to just, you know, focus for now and say that, you know, the problem isn't judging. The problem is how we do it. There's one last uh, aspect, the third aspect of psychological bias before I get to the rubber hits the road stuff. And so I talked about, you know, the bias towards familiarity and seeing, the bias towards categorization judgment in general. And the third one is the bias towards quick and easy. At the end of the day, our brains are energy saving machines that wants to do things as efficiently as possible. The world is too big. There's too much going on to waste time figuring things out. It just wants to make these quick judgments and move on. So when it comes to us and when it comes to, you know, going get back to the culture stuff, how that translates is we pull from received wisdom. It's the easiest thing to pull from what we've read what we've seen, what our parents have taught us, what our cultural traditions have taught us about how to understand the world, how to understand other people. And we default to that stuff. I think you guys are starting to get the picture, hopefully you're getting the picture of how, you know, this like things that are, that really are just benign and just the way things work, how those forces can come together and generate you know, that, that biased tree can produce the racist fruit. So we're biased towards familiarity. We don't know a lot, know as much. We're not neurologically inclined to be as affiliative and, and familiar with people from outgroup, other races, other, you know, unfamiliar people, right? So then we have a bias towards categorization and judgment. So since we don't have the ability to recognize that stuff, then judgments come in right? More likely to come in with other people and they're more likely to come in easier, quicker, faster, and it come from our cultures. We're more likely to pull from what we know than actually connecting and spending that time with the other race. All the seeds are there, aren't they? All the seeds are there for all these psychological processes that are completely uh, morally neutral to produce some problematic stuff. hopes with this video is to present a common, very widely applicable framework for understanding all sorts of interactions, you know, along uh, gender lines and LGBTQ and, you know, different races and cultures and interactions. I mean, they, we, everywhere where there's brains, right, <laughs> which is everywhere uh, where there's humans, I think some of these elements are going to be in play. Uh, in this video, I'm going to focus mostly on the black experience. Uh, for various reasons, that's something I'm especially connected with, and it's Black History Month, so, you know, folds right in, right? So, what we're talking about is how all these biases can kind of combine to generate racism against black people. So, we're talking about these cultural, these cultural um, images, which we call stereotypes, right? Uh, stereotypes are quick judgments that become formed and are instantiated in culture, and they're laid upon out uh, out group, you know, uh, that you're know, just kind of an like easy heuristic, so that we don't, you know, because we don't, we're not naturally familiar with them. We, our brains don't light up as much when we interact if you're not among that group, right? Uh, not that we can't have stereotypes of our own, but they become more pernicious and dangerous when they're across groups. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about um, just to you know pick a random starting point. 
uh, turn of, turn of the uh, 20th century, there was movement in America and in, you know the, the European world too, but especially in America for scientific racism. Scientific racism is the reality that there are biological inherent um, deficiencies in the uh, the black race that the black race is further down on the evolutionary track. This is when evolution was you know, first becoming a cultural, culturally known thing and that blacks were closer to apes than they were to humans, which fully developed humans, of course, is white folk, right? According to that particular way of seeing the world. Debunked, complete BS, but we bear that. We bear that image that equation of black equals ape. And they've done studies on this, right? I mean, again, this is all kind of based in research and psychology. I have some, you know, uh, there's a there's a book that I've listed down there where I get a lot of my information. There's other articles too. Um, that it isn't just like, you know, uh, you know, comparing a black person to like a dark animal. Like this doesn't map onto squirrels or, you know, like alligators or anything along those lines. It maps onto apes. This idea that the black person uh, is a savage, this black person is inclined to crime, not as intelligent. Oh, you go on down the line and these stereotypes, these judgments that we have made that we rely on rather than relying on actually seeing the person, they get baked in there. They get baked into our consciousness. It's kind of even through even after scientific racism and I'll take some really easy examples. Like when I was a kid, I rooted for the basketball team, the New York Knicks. And they had a uh, player called Patrick Ewing. When they didn't play well, they threw bananas at him. That was in the 80s. Have we developed since then? This happened a couple of years ago. Uh, Serena Williams, the famous ba uh, tennis player, uh, she was losing a match or something bad happened and she kind of lost her temper. And this was a cartoon that was made to kind of you know make fun of the of the area and it's like okay you know the person who drew it's like well, i have free speech i can write what i want but why'd you draw that where'd that come from i think we know where that came from so that's how stereotypes lead to explicit racism but you might be sitting there uh going that's not me you know that's that's unfortunate and that's a uh you know a thing that we got to fight against but you know, that's you know i don't participate in that uh, you know all all the good things and to, you know, I'm not going to deny that. I mean, I think there are a lot of people that, you know, for the most part are nice and they have, you know, the, the, the quote unquote black friends and they're not against this stuff. They're participating in multicultural uh, space. But there is a form of racism and bias that is implicit, that is working at the bottom of our brains, that is not at our forefront conscious mind, that doesn't generate explicit racist effects, but that actually has effects in the world in much smaller ways and that can radiate out and cause larger effects. I like to um, equate implicit bias, another one of my analogies, um, implicit bias is like um, a traffic jam. So how do traffic jams start, right? Unless it's like a big construction thing, like mo a lot of traffic jams start with one or two cars just breaking. Right. You know, all of a sudden, you know, a couple of cars break and then what happens? Other cars respond. So then you get one car breaking and then it's like a, a wave effect. This car breaks, this car breaks, this car breaks. And now all of a sudden, if enough cars are breaking and if enough cars are kind of you know, making, uh, you know, whatever decision on the road, now you're stuck in a long traffic jam. Every instance of implicit bias, every way in which we make an action that is unconscious of what of those stereotypes about, you know, in this case, I'm focusing on black folks, every instance where we make a judgment that, oh, this person is ignorant, this person doesn't know uh, as much as a white person, this person is less good with money, this person is, is uh, you know, whatever it is, it's like one that one little decision can have ripple effects across, in this case, the entire society. So I'm going to get to games in a minute, but I really think it's important to, to get that last cultural piece in before I kind of bring it around to our uh, particular community. The reason
reason I'm going through the larger cultural context is because that's what people bring. Uh, gamers that we call our friends, members of our, of our community, really got to know the background of what's going on in their lives if we want to really understand why this stuff is so important. Okay. So let me start with wealth, right? I mean, that's that's as real as it gets, right? It, it, this is how we can really measure how a group is doing or one measure of how a group is doing, a very important one. So in America, blacks have about 10 times less wealth, not income, just wealth, capital, however you want to put it, uh, than the typical white family. Uh, white families will have around 170,000 to 190,000, including house. So they're including the mortgage and everything. Um, so it's not liquid. <laughs> it's just everything where the average black family will have about 17 to 20,000 as of, uh, 2017, 10 times the difference. Uh, in the 1960s, it was 10 times the difference. We actually have not made a lot of progress or in some ways we've actually moved backwards. There are explicit racist reasons for this division, especially going back, right? So then you know, we don't have to go into over the litany of like, you know, slavery and everything. Um, but, you know, as we've kind of moved past all that, there were, there were a lot of things that happened in housing that are really important in this decision. You have entire states like Oregon that were founded uh, based on the basis of white supremacy. Uh, so if you saw the panel of black content creators, uh, Monique uh, talked about growing up in origin and saying like, quote unquote, illegal to be black. Not an exaggeration. Um, you know, that it wasn't illegal like in, in her time, but it, it the whole state comes from a tradition where it was literally illegal to be black. And, you know, there was, you know, when that was totally enforced, Every six months, they bring out to the public square and flog you and say, get out. And if you don't get out, we're going to bring you back in six months. We're going to flog you again. That happened. That's the 18th century. Now we're going to the 19th century or, or the 1800s. We're going to the 1900s. And in the 1900s, we had the buildup of in America suburbs, right? So like most wealthy people, most people with at least, you know, a house, house-based wealth um, concentrated in the suburbs. And when the suburbs, you know, developed here in America, who blacks not there, not, not allowed there either. The housing, the the grants that were given to houses, the loans that were given to houses were, you know, basically targeted to, you know, be segregationist. And you know, the blacks were the, what they call redlined into certain districts. Uh, so the banks would do it, but backed by the federal government, where blacks would be consigned to these areas. And, you know, this is where you belong. And if you want to go out there, you are not allowed. That's baked into the system, right? And that's explicit bias. And that's the, that, and there's so much more that I could have talked about in terms of the explicit cultural things that have led to blacks not having opportunity, wealth, you know, wealth builds on wealth. Uh, the, the One of the main ways that you get wealth is you inherit it. If there's nothing to inherit, then that becomes a really difficult thing. Our society has gotten bit by bit better and better by, you know, making the explicit uh, instance of racism illegal or, you know, culturally discouraged, but the implicit lives on. Let's talk about banks, right? You know, we're talking about homes, right? Can blacks get, get blacks have access to homes? Well, black and brown home buyers are rejected far more than whites. You have about a one in 10 denial rate for whites, where for a black person that rises to around two in 10. So you have a 10% increase in the just the outright rejections of a black uh, home buyer. And you have a phenomenon where if anybody does own a home, you know what your mortgage is and you're paying a mortgage rate, blacks and browns tend to have higher rates. You know, sometimes by even like, you know, five, six percent higher rates that you're paying. So money that could be going into your standing wealth is being sucked out and taken by whatever bank or lending institution. There's the wealth that's going away. And that's implicit bias because this, it's actually illegal to discriminate. But those face to face negotiations between, you know, banker and buyer, those, um, you know, or, or like an, even an application, even an algorithm 
can be biased because it, it puts, puts a bunch of things in the calculation, spits out a number, and it's like, all right, we've got to take the number, but they might not know that that number is generated by preconditions, prejudgments that have racist effect. So that's buying a home. Like there's, It goes down the line, too. So let's say uh, you want to go on a vacation, you want to rent the home. <laughs> Airbnb. Airbnb is fabulous. I've used Airbnb uh, many times in my own trips. Uh, much more cost-effective than going to a hotel. Uh, it is where private people list their, ho- list their house or their room or whatever, and you know someone could sign up and j- have it for a day, a week, or whatever it is. Just rent it like you would any kind of hotel room. Fabulous service. They found, especially, you know, as it was Airbnb was getting hot, like, you know, 2016, 2017, around there, that black folks were 16 percent more likely to be told that there is no occupancy in the in whatever the space was. It was and and they can they did a huge experiment on this and they looked at, you know, um, the different cities, you know, large cities, small cities. They look internationally, uh, different areas. It was across the across the board, somewhere averaging around a 16 percent rate of rejection. And they knew it was race because what they would do is, you know, black people would get their white friends to sign up for it. And all of a sudden it's open or um they would change their profile. So like they, all of a sudden, you know, they signed up as a white person and it's like, oh, wow, we're, well, look at that. We do have an occupancy. They would, you know, you'd ask the owners and the owners wouldn't be aware. That's what makes it implicit. It's like, well, I, I, I didn't, I had no idea that was what I was doing. I was just, you know, I have, I'm very busy and I'm just like kind of, you know, clicking buttons and, and, and whatever, whatever. But like, you know, operating behind the scenes in the implicit area, are those judgments that the black person is noisy? They're going to steal something. They're going to be raucous. They're going to invite something into my home. They're going to be bring the dirty. They're going to whatever it is. Those implicit things that operate behind the scenes. Does it happen all the time? No. This is you know sixteen percent is not a hundred percent, but sixteen percent is enough to make an impact. It's like a that one little break that can cause that can contribute to the larger traffic jam. So we're talking about wealth building, we're talking about, you know, a community trying to become more prosperous, more able to engage in leisure activities like, you know, our activity, gaming ain't cheap, so you need some money, <laughs> you need access to the air, the spaces, the areas in order to engage in our wonderful hobby. We've talked about houses, let's talk about jobs. Black people, and most actually, this actually happens across multiple different ethnic groups, but uh, blacks in particular. They tend to be rejected at higher rates just off of resumes than other um, than than the whites. So then there was a famous study, and this one you can re- you can look up when as much as you want. Invite you to. Um, this was out of Chicago and Boston, and what happened was they would made a bunch of fake resumes, sent them out to a bunch of different jobs across across you know wherever, uh, different agencies, mostly corporate, and. So what ended up happening was they put, you know, a couple of the resumes would have black sounding names like J- J- Tyrone, Jamal, uh, Keisha, and Tamika. And another group of resumes would have names like Jeffrey, Brad, Emily, or Jill. And I think it was something where around 50% fewer callbacks for the black sounding names. If your name is a black sounding name, you are there's an assumption that that person is less qualified, less intelligent, and you you ask the person, you ask the hiring manager. I know perhaps hiring managers personally, and you know they can be lovely people, but the it's quick, and you know if you're if you're in a corporate hiring firm, you just have a pile of resumes and maybe even the hundred thousands, and you just turn it through them, turn it through them, looking for any reason, just kind of move them on, and the that where where you have that emphasis on speed. That's where, again, the implicit bias would come in and that error is going to get chucked off. Attached to that one, here's another study. Uh, this was uh, relevant to white or black and Asian uh, applicants. So they measured uh, this process called whitening a resume. So, you know, taking a white name or, you know, especially, I think uh, in Asian cultures, it's, it's common where you, you know, if you come to America, you kind of take that Americanized name to you know as, as a way of kind of fitting in a little bit better they, they put that name on there they're not going to put that um you know the, the cultural the culturally accurate name and 
they don't only do that. The whole process of whitening the resume is like it's a little deeper than that. So like if you were part of a cultural institution, you know, you were part of, you know, uh, the Black Caucus of, you know, Student Affairs, all of a sudden becomes Caucus of Student Affairs. Or if you have a, a hobby that, you know, like you, you, you play a lot of whatever it is, handball or streetball or whatever it is, now all of a sudden you're playing, you're kayaking and you're snowboarding. Uh, wider sounding uh, hobbies and activities. Apparently, uh, you go from somewhere around a 10% rate of callback to 20% rate of callback. So when assessing what is going on in um, the black community, especially here in America, you got to talk about criminal justice. For my European brothers and sisters, uh, that is, if you're going to understand anything about what's going on here, you have to understand it through the lens of criminal justice. So it has so many like kind of ripple effects as I've described. Uh, you know, having a criminal record limits you in so many ways. You you know, your job scenarios are so much more constricted. And theoretically, a hiring manager shouldn't be able to ask you about your uh, criminal background, but they do anyway, and that's just disqualifying. Um, it pre it prevents you from getting licensed. The reason I can do what I can do is because I have a license. And if I had a criminal record that I couldn't have this license, I probably wouldn't even be here. As, as sad as that is to say, or at least I wouldn't be at the level of salary that I am. I wouldn't be able to provide for my family the way I want to. Um, you know, uh, any healthcare field, education field, even barber. <laughs> I didn't know that being a barber could, especially in some states, um, they that having a criminal record, a certain kind of criminal record, uh, prevents you from getting a barber's license. Man. And the story has gotten worse over time. So in 1980, you had about 5% of adult men that had records. 13% of black men had records. Uh, I'm not going to wait into that controversy. I know that people have different opinions on that, but it's just a, a out of whack percentage. I mean, I think the criminal justice system has that as, as ad, it's eye trained on the black community for way longer than this video can encompass. That's where we were, though, in 1980. Now we're all the way up to 13% uh, from 5% overall who have criminal convictions. 33% uh, of black men have some kind of felony charge on their record nowadays. They did not, you know, black men did not become doubly violent or doubly law, um, you know, uh, unabiding. It's just our laws have changed, our enforcement has changed, our policies have changed, and we've criminalized more and more things. We've criminalized more and more people. And it's, it goes even further than that. So I think uh, in America, the one of the main points of interaction with the, with the police for anybody is through your vehicle. So many of us have been stopped for speeding or for some kind of moving violation. So, you know, that's usually where a, a lot of folks, you know, will focus in terms of the poli interactions with police. Um, blacks are, you know, twice as likely to be stopped for a lot of reasons, for moving violations and also for what they call uh, high discretionary equipment violations. Broken taillight, the the plate is it, it maybe it's expired or maybe it's even out of state, which I didn't know was a um of, of any kind of equipment violation, but it's high discretion. So, you know, you can when you're filling out the form, they check the the cop checks that box and there you go. And and blacks are twice as likely to be stopped for that. Not only that, they're much more likely to be to have some kind of negative altercation, they're more likely to be um used less respectful language. So there's more of a more friction there entirely. When it's a white person, more likely to use ma'am, sir, that kind of thing. With a black person, not as likely. The interaction goes poorly. Um, the, the black person is more likely to get arrested, more likely to be taken into the station, more likely to not have the money for bail. So they take a plea deal. Plea deals, you admit to guilt, criminal record. You see... Stop, 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 stop. Does this happen all the time? Absolutely not. There are you know, many, many people that can go their entire lives without having any of this kind of interaction. But in the black community, you probably know somebody. 
You probably have a, a personal story. You know somebody has a personal story. I was affected by this. This isn't about a blanket reality. Believe me, I'm not describing, thank God I'm not describing a blanket reality. I'm describing little instances that radiate out and have a cumulative effect of injuring a community. I imagine you, the viewer at this point, might be a little bit exhausted by this whole thing. <laughs> That's a lot of stats. And I'm not even done yet. I haven't even mentioned schools. Black children are way high, way more likely to be disciplined. They're more likely to be uh, cited for discipline. They're more likely to receive uh, go-home suspensions. They're more likely to face harsher discipline uh, than uh, white compatriots. Uh, in the medical field, they are uh, more likely to receive poor treatment, especially if the... Um, it's between races. Like it goes back to that kind of um, faulty seeing. So, you know, white doctors and nurses might come in there with the most, you know, the best of intentions, but they might not be able to see problems that are going on, which is a huge problem, especially in maternity. Uh, the, the black women maternity fatality rate is much higher than it is for whites. There's just not enough um, uh, black folks or people who have that familiarity to be able to see subtle signs that can really help uh, a woman who's giving birth or a woman who's going through some kind of maternal, part of the maternal process. So that is a ton of stuff. Uh, I got one more for you. I got to bring it home. There's a gaming channel, the games behind me, y'all are gamers in the audience, implicit bias and gaming. So I'm going to say a lot more about gaming in the final episode, which will be a lot shorter. This will be more of a coda to what I present here. But I just wanted to put a bow on this discussion and invite some reflection. And this is something, a question I ask of myself as well. Uh, have we leaned towards the familiar, familiar faces, familiar games, familiar people in our games, in our gaming stores? Have we ever, you know, make somebody who is different from us feel unwelcome, not because we're bad people, but because we just have a bias towards the familiar and things that feel good. It's neurological. And when we don't, we aren't reflective on it, then it'll just, you know, kind of take us off in directions that we generally don't want, right? Um, and I hope that I've described that in the previous 40 some odd minutes of this video, right? Um have we ever looked at games or game designers, names on boxes or content creators, people on the screen and made judgments, you know, about the quality, about the content? Maybe uh, a person will look at a POC or some uh, kind of non-traditional uh, content creator and say, that's not for me. Well, again, I mean, I don't want to accuse anybody of anything in, in person. This stuff is really, really hard and what i hope to have done in the context of this video essay is to give us tools to address some of this stuff in the most constructive way possible okay so uh, i will conclude this video by laying all of my cards out on the table so this is my attempt at a massive exercise of empathy. It's in response to internet arguments, as I said in the beginning of the episode, how I just feel like, you know, it's pretty peaceful now as I record this thing, but, you know, the, the friction points are there, right? And then one side oh, is kind of always thinking that the other one means harm or that the other one is just like hopelessly, willfully, you know, like ignorant or whatever it is. I don't know what people think. Um, for me, I feel like, we're just kind of bumbling along in our common humanity and we have a lot of biases working against us. In some ways, our, our greatest enemy isn't each other, it's this and how it works and how biases, the, especially the bias towards familiarity, it's a huge one, right? How we tend towards the familiar and then other people can kind of feel some type of way about that. And we make judgment based off of like only knowing familiar things. Uh, you can see how all this stuff kind of like flames up. And I want to just kind of take a step back, get us back to a, a more of a beginner space and say, you know what? We all have biases. That is a part of being human. I, I, I Maybe I'm being Pollyanna, right? I think we have more in common than we do uh, divide, especially from a neurological perspective. And so what do we do with that, right? Um, we try to have empathy for that situation. That's why I uh, had the video uh, previous to this was about empathy. So 
you know, on the POC side, if we see people that are making mistakes, you know, is, is there a way that we can kind of see that as a case by case thing rather than just like, oh, my God, here we go again uh, and just and respond in kind, depending on what the person is saying and bringing all that. And on the, um, you know, a, a more moderate uh, side, is there a way to, you know, if a POC is asking for more representation? But POC is asking for more voices in the room, more uh, names of designers on boxes. Uh, you know, uh, BGG has been done a great job with Black History Month, seeing all those faces. That's not just a divisive thing. It's not just a, a, a whiny SJW thing. We're asking for stimulation of our fusiform face areas. This is biological. And it's something that y'all have. Y'all got that. <laughs> <laughs> y'all look everywhere in the everyone in the bg top 100 uh all in our community y'all get that familiarity we're still working on it so empathy just all around you know, as much as possible and obviously you know there's accountability there's like uh, there's like outer stuff that should probably should be questioned uh pretty heavily but just the, in that space i want to try to make this as big a space as possible and i'm hopeful that the information science-based in this video is a small contribution towards making that bigger tent. So this is Jason reminding you, if you change your mind, you can change the world. Please go ahead and like my video, subscribe to my channel, all that good stuff. Shelf Stories is here for you, and I'm looking forward to continued conversation. So until next time, cause some good trouble.